Hello everyone, welcome to the Rugby League lunch hour here at loverugbyleague.com HQ with myself James Gordon and Drew Derbyshire. Um, we had to shut the door in the office so it's very hot in here. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to have our week, all oh, we missed last week, we're going to have our weekly run through of all the news uh, from this week. We're going to talk about the RFL, we're going to talk about Tony Adams, Great Britain, transfers and then we'll look ahead to the weekend's games of course, Challenge Cup semi-final weekend and 1895 Cup semi-finals as well. Um, we'll start with uh, with Wednesday I suppose. Yesterday we went to uh, to Doncaster so it was the RFL's AGM in Doncaster so all the clubs were present um, and then there was a little press media gathering, gathering yeah, after with uh, the new Rugby Football League president Tony Adams uh, new Vice President Carl Hall, um, outgoing Chairman Brian Barwick and then the Interim Chairman Simon Johnson. Um, it was hot in that room. Very, very hot. Yeah. That's what I can remember mostly to be fair James. It's getting hot in here now though because we've, we've had to shut the door and the fans <laughs> are, are have to be switched off because of uh, it'll probably just sound like someone's going to shh down the camera. The, um, so tell us what, what, what do you think about Tony Adams? So obviously Tony Adams, so for those who don't know, Tony Adams, obviously former England football captain, he is now the new president of the RFL. It's a hot, it's an honorary ceremonial role, so it's not a, a salaried or yeah. um you know or an office role so so to speak. Um which is it's largely come through his sporting chant the connection with sporting chants which the RFL have had a um, a, a relationship with for, for some years, and, and and to be fair to Tony Adams, he he said that the RFL one of the leading stakeholders in, in sport in chance. Um, what does Tony Adams bring to the game? Well, it certainly brings profile, doesn't it? Uh, first and foremost, obviously, when we um, remember Andy Burnham being a, being the the president of the RFL, it didn't really give as much profile as what I originally thought he would. Uh, I don't think we've seen him an awful lot in, in the game uh, or at games or at meetings as well. Uh, I think he was a little bit of a letdown, if I'm honest, uh, in his role as RFL president. Obviously, we, I think the only time when I seen him uh, was presenting Catalan's Dragons with a Challenge Cup trophy at Wembley last year. But Tony Adams seems to be uh, quite passionate about this role. He's, he's already said though that he's He's not got a lot of rugby league knowledge. Uh, he's not getting involved with, with like the, the technical side of the game uh, in effect, um, and he, he just wants to to put all his focus really on the off the field stuff, which is uh, the players' mental health uh, and promoting the game to wider audiences. Which I think it's fair enough. I think I think it's fair play to him for being so honest and saying is it. it He's, he's not got a lot of rugby league knowledge. He actually turns to his old England teammate, uh, Stuart Pearce, uh, for some rugby tips uh, because he watches Warrington Wolves. So, overall, I, I think it's a positive step for the sport. Uh, it's not going to it's not going to be a life changing for the sport, but it, it can certainly help to, to grow the market. Is um, I'm all, I'm always a bit sceptical, I have to say, about these sorts of appointments because obviously. In practice, it sounds good having Tony Adams and and profile and, yeah. and whatever. But is that is that more of a, a more of a, a, a wish or a dream more so than reality? If you know what I mean, you know, is there really people outside of rugby league who are going to take notice of rugby league just because Tony Adams is is the president? Uh, not necessarily the rugby league, but if if you're reading flicking through the national newspapers and it's got Tony Adams on a full page like it has in the Guardian, the Mirror. Uh, and the sun today, uh, I think uh, I, it, it should grow the sport because a lot of people are finding out about rugby league by just flicking through pages. It's appeared on the likes of Sky News since the news broke out that he, he was going to be the RFL president, uh, and on big, big websites like like BBC and uh, Sky uh, News. So uh, I'm all for it, James. I, th I think it's a decent step in the right direction. For the sport. And, a, and a nice balance, I suppose, with Carl Hall. So Carl Hall is um, Doncaster. He runs the rugby league side at, at Doncaster. Um, Kiwi guy, passionate guy. I suppose a nice balance between someone in Tony Adams who raises the profile of the game and 
you know, that side. But then on the other, in his vice president, Carlo, someone who's really passionate and knowledgeable about the game. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a good appointment for him as well. He's obviously well known within the rugby league community, and he probably knows what he well he does. He he knows far more about the sport than what Tony Adams does, and that's what Tony said uh, at his press conference yesterday. He said that, look, I don't, I've not got a lot of knowledge, but Carl will help me when it comes to these meetings, and he will feed um, information into me about the money aspect side of the game. Uh, which is fair enough because obviously he's got a lot of experience with it with Doncaster in League One and obviously he's looking to get Doncaster into the Championship. But what what struck me most about Carl is just his pure passion for the game. He loves rugby league, doesn't he? And that, and that's what he actually said in in the press conference. He he loves rugby league. Uh, so I'm all for it. For, I mean, for I must admit, I, I think it was quite humbling listening to Carl Hall talk about you know how he was almost not starstruck, but almost couldn't believe that he's got to a point in his life where he's been asked to be vice president. He mentioned about having a tough upbringing and, and rugby league give him that, yeah. you know, got him somewhere, obviously made him come over here and, and, and play rugby and whatnot. So, um, you know, interesting. And of course, Brian Barwick stepping down um, to be replaced by Simon Johnson, who's been on the board for the past mm -hmm. five years. Um, Brian Barwick cops a lot of criticism, doesn't he, I think? Um, we had a little bit of a chat about this yesterday on the drive home. I think it's difficult sometimes because, I mean, realistically, and they said this yesterday, the last 18 months have been an absolute nightmare for rugby league. So you've had the split, the Super League split, and, you know, everyone pulling in different directions. And it has been a, a, a pretty tough time. And as much as, um, you know, and we don't know, you know, fans and, 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 and even us as media, we don't know exactly what happens behind the scenes in, in these meetings. Ultimately, the board, the RFL board have got to sit in these meetings. They've got to try and mediate. They've got to try and come up with the best idea for sport. And it must be difficult to do that when you've got, you know, however many different factions saying, well, we want you to do it this way, we want you to do it that way. Yeah, yeah, I, I do understand. Um, but uh, we, we did have like a 50-50 discussion in the car. And I just thought that the time was right for Brad Barwick uh, to move on from the sport. Obviously, it's, the sport, it's, it's a difficult one because the last two years, the sport's been at loggerheads because the Super League's been breaking away from the RFL. The RFL have, and Super League have acted a little bit so towards each other at times over these last two years. I don't think they should have had a breakaway because I just think the sport's not big enough for this. The sport's not big enough to have two chief, chief execs, for, one for Super League, one for the RFL. Uh, it's certainly not, I don't think it's big enough to pay the salaries of both of them uh, if, the report, if the, they are what they're reported to be, uh, which is over £200,000. Um, but yeah, I think it was time for Brian to move on. Um, I, I don't have a problem with, problem, uh, with him as a person. Um, he seems a decent bloke, but I just think the timing was right to, to look forwards rather than just... Uh, stay uh, where we were so obviously we we sat through um the press conference yesterday and then, and then late last night or sort of early evening the rfl published um some words from the general meeting and, and the main headline was that the rfl posted a loss of three hundred and twenty seven thousand pounds in, in 2018 which they attributed to the low challenge cup crowd so you know a bit of context behind that the crowd was just over fifty thousand. the previous year it was sixty eight thousand. That 68,000 crown was actually considerably less than previous years as well. I think the highest was something like 85,000 um, since the new Wembley. Um, of course, it probably no surprise that the RFL lost a lot of money because we had all this fuss at the turn of the year where they were saying, right, Catalan, Toulouse, Toronto, if you want to be in it, yeah. you're going to have to pay 500,000 pounds to enter. And I guess that is to... Yeah, you, you can kind of understand both sides of the argument for this one, can't you? Because I, I know that when we, we published the article last night, there was a lot of people commenting saying, oh, the RFL's marketing's been shocking and so on. But the RFL, to not have a loss of 327,000, <laughs> would have had to have superhero uh, superheroes for that marketing. match, yeah. yeah. Cause because, I mean, if you think, I mean, it, it's, I mean so, it's just so difficult because what. what what do you do? And Ralph Rimmer, the RFL chief exec, has been so open and honest about this in, in pre previous podcasts, previous shows and, and whatnot. He's, he said that the thing is with the Challenge Cup final these days, it competes with a Magic Weekend, it competes with a Summer Bash, and obviously it competes with the Grand Final. At one time when, when I, well, I, my parents and 
all our grandparents and they used to go to, to Wembley for the day out. That was a short piece of event in the sport in this country. It wasn't the grand final and we didn't have Magic Weekend or Summer Bash to compete with. So that what that was people's weekend sorted. So that's why they got the the I mean, I mean, it, sell out every single year. But it's it's different now because there's only two teams competing in the Charles Cup final. Whereas Magic Weekend pe people can see every single Super League team. So that's why they go to Newcastle or Liverpool, uh, where it was held this year. Um, so that's why the attendances are dropping. It, they're not dropping because uh, it, it's the the quality is has yeah. gone down. I think. I mean. I mean. Ultimately, you've got to look at it. You know, let's say twenty thousand twenty quid is four hundred grand. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like it's fairly simple to see where that drop yeah. off is. Um, I suppose the concern is that I mean, obviously the RFL have now budgeted this year, so they're budgeting to make a, a two hundred thousand yeah. pound profit this year to, to sort of make up for that. Um, which ultimately means that somewhere, somewhere, mm -hmm. two hundred thousand pounds being saved. Um, but ultimately, as much as we talk about, if if I mean, it's not going to happen, obviously. But if if it is is it not a genuine concern that what happens if can the, can the sport afford to have Catalan or Toronto or whoever else making these finals? As much, you know, no disrespect to those teams, meant, but if the econom economic reality is that every time a Catalan or a Toronto reaches a final, the RFL is going to lose £300,000, mm. how, how can you can't, uh, surely you can't. Surely you can't do that year in year out. This is, oh, this is what I'm saying. You can see both sides of the argument perfectly because it's okay. Um, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, advocate of the Toronto Wolfpack, I, I, hope, I hope they do well, but then you've got to ask, well when they reach a Super League Grand Final, they're not going to, the RFL are going to, going to be at another minus 200,000, maybe minus 300,000. And, 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 and obviously people will say, yeah, but what about Toronto, bring all this sponsorship and all the broadcast, but I think part of the issue at the moment is the Super League clubs are being a little short-sighted in terms of Toronto because they want to... It's almost like at the moment Toronto are on board, but they're not giving anything from our pot, if you like. But ultimately, if if in five years Toronto are reaching finals yeah. and Toronto have got their TV deal, all of a sudden the English clubs are going to be saying, "Well, hang on, you need to give us some money." I think, and I think that's where there's a yeah, bit. Yeah, I think I think we, we obviously we're speaking with Phil Kaplan, the forty twenty editor, at, at the meeting yesterday while I was waiting, and it was he made a valid point where we, we need to come to a decision: Do we want this? American market or not, there's there's no point doing what I know I know it, there's a process for it to be made, but there's no point in kind of having just Toronto and that's it because obviously we we know Ottawa. Well, and you, uh, you could say you could say the same about well. is it are we going to have a North American league or or a real Super League? You could say teams. the same about the and European let, let market the, though as well. You know, with France. Oh yeah, France, yeah, so. the European market as well. But and let the likes of. Uh, a Wakefield and Hulkey are playing the championship and have, a, have a, an all English or an all British um, league and then have the, the super super league so you, you, you'll have the likes of Ottawa, New York, Toronto, Wigan, Saints, Warrington, Leeds. Yeah because clearly having Ottawa and New York playing against with all due respect Batley and Dewsbury yeah. that isn't going to break the North American market yeah. do you know what I mean and, that, and, that's, and that's part of the issue isn't it at the moment where you know, on the one hand, everyone's saying, "Oh, yeah, but there's loads of money and you know, commercial and broadcast deals in America, and whatever." But that doesn't align with playing games at Castleford or Wakefield or Batley or Dewsbury, does it? I mean, that's you know, with all you know, no disrespect to those places, but that's that's reality. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, I mean, obviously, it's been done to death, hasn't it? And we've had it. I think I, I remember writing a few blogs about this. It's like. If you're gonna do it, let's do it right. Let's get a franchise league in place at the top, and then make the British Rugby League Championship and the British Rugby League Division One, and have the automatic promotion relegation, and and do it that way. And like well, I say, well, the, the issue at the moment is that you don't know where anyone's got. You don't know where anyone's going, do you? You don't know. We haven't got a clue. It's 2019 now. We haven't got a clue what things are gonna look like in two years. Yeah. And it's like, how can the sport? How can how can you go to a sponsor and say? You want we want to deal with you for three years, when you don't know what it's going to look like after two years, yeah. and ultimately for rugby league to grow, it needs sponsors that are going to commit. You know, I don't foresee a sponsor getting value out of rugby league on a one-year sponsorship deal. You need to get companies on board that are going to be on board for two, three, four years. We've got the twenty twenty-one World Cup coming up. You know, 
if all the stadiums, you know, they're hoping to sell out all the stadiums at the 2021 World Cup. If no one's got a clue what the format's going to be in 2022, then you're going to lose, you're going to miss that massive opportunity. Yeah, yeah. We've got a couple of questions coming in on Facebook as well. Louis says, "What is it with the RFL employing ex FA employees on big salaries?" By which fleeced us. Tony Adams is a good appointment. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's easy to be sceptical about Brian Barwick, and I and I do agree to a some degree because ultimately he's still the head of the, the National yeah. League in football. So it's just another pie for him, really. Um, you know, it's not. He's not someone who's you know unlike a Carl Hall say he's not someone who's living and breathing rugby league he's it's just a, another job for him you know and that's with all due respect to him you know everyone everyone needs a job and whatever but I think that's the concern with that FA sort of thing isn't it it's, you know you know the FA wouldn't just appoint Jamie Peacock yeah. in some sort of role on a big salary would they um, and I think you know there are instances, and to be fair, that's why I'm quite I quite like the Carl Hall appointment because I think rugby league too often alienates people that are passionate about it, and they alienate people they don't keep in people. They always go for the big names. Yeah, and it's yeah. like you know I remember the 2013 World Cup. There was a brilliant team behind the scenes that helped sell out the the 2013 rugby league World Cup and, and and you know make a great tournament. Well, a lot of those people aren't involved anymore because they weren't kept on or they weren't offered deals or they moved out and you know. All, or all their money was taken by Nigel Wood or whatever. And it's just like, you know, I think that's a concern, definitely. Because ultimately, rugby league needs people that are going to give him m substantial value for money. Yeah. Um, David Taylor says, understand the Denver money didn't come through. No. Was this mentioned? Is there any one going to be held um, to account? Well, it was the promoter of the Denver test between England and New Zealand was... Um, Jason Moore International, I think it was called, or James Moore International. And no, Jim, yeah, Jason and, Moore it was. Yeah, and they went into I mean, the company went into administration, didn't it? So they, they, they I mean, that's to, a, I to mean, that's the RFL. The, the RFL never received this money. Um, them and the Kiwis both lost money on it. But I mean, isn't it isn't it just a sad indictment of rugby league that some one random bloke can get a test match taken over to America and then not pay for it? I mean, how? How pathetic is that? Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it just goes to show that it you was can't just desperation. Wasn't yeah, it? you can't just to, you can't just game, you can't just keep bending over and getting all gooey eyed over anyone who's got money because ultimately, yeah, okay, we need money, but you need money in the right way. Yeah. And ultimately, this hasn't even brought in any money because you yeah. know you've not seen it. So uh, Phil Haynes, Stuart Pearce probably knows more about uh, the sport than Tony Adams. What do you think? Well, we mentioned that earlier on in the show. Tony Adams said yesterday he turns to Stuart Pearce uh, for uh, some tips and a bit of advice on rugby league sometimes. But uh, and Stuart, Pe Stuart Pearce probably knows more about the sport than Tony Adams, but he's not uh, as high profile as he is than Tony Adams. He's still very well known uh, um, football level. I don't, I don't know. I don't I think. think uh, I, mean... I think Adams is far is far more uh, popular than. Than uh, Pierce, but it's, it's not it's not it's not about um, in terms of popularity, is it? No, it's, no, no. It's the it's the fact that Adams oh, has got a, a fantastic Pierce, Stuart... charity in the sporting <laughs> clinic that's that's helped many many rugby league stars. Stuart Pierce ultimately uh, is years. is a great ambassador for the game already. Yeah. So you know he, you know you've already got him. He's almost like an honorary president if you like. He's already doing it yep. um, off his own bat. Uh, David also has so Rimmer is blaming the Challenge Cup demise on other RL games. Whose fault is that? He, he's not necessarily blaming other uh, sh sh other events in rugby league. I think Ralph Rimmer cops a lot of unnecessary stick at times because obviously he's the man at the top, and, mm -hmm. and if anything goes wrong, he's the man to beat with the bat, so to speak. But uh, uh, I think I, I, what, what what he was highlighting is just the fact that the Challenge Cup doesn't sell out anymore because. It's got Pit, competition. Like, rugby league is still very much a working class sport. And, and you can't. And can't the, other, the other thing is, event. the other thing is, I think it's, I think it's a poor excuse to 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 hit the RFL with the marketing because ultimately every rugby league fan knows when the Challenge Cup final is. Yeah. They know when it is. They know where it is. I think it's a very poor excuse to blame the RFL's marketing because everybody yeah. knows when it is. Yeah. You know, does that mean in twenty eleven when there was eighty five thousand people there that was good marketing? They weren't getting praised for good marketing there. And I think, yeah, I think the RFL cop, cops are fine. The bottom line is, is Catalan being in the final meant that the crowd was down by 18,000. Ultimately, 18,000, 20 quid. 
is yeah. three hundred and sixty thousand pounds. The loss was three hundred twenty-seven thousand. I mean, it, it's as black and white as that. Yeah. Uh, David Taylor also had uh, Toronto versus Catalan's final. Whose fault would that be? And who sanctioned uh, expansionism? Well, I mean, I well, mean, Toronto don't compete in the Charles Cup. It's a bit they? well not because of the you know for this exact the reason basically because you can imagine if that did happen. You know, the RFL lost three hundred and twenty-seven thousand pounds when only one was in there. Now imagine if both would have got in there and the RFL have lost seven hundred thousand. Where does that money come from? Because if you know, the RFL must have had some cash in reserve to cover that loss. But all of a sudden, if you're getting into a stage where you're seven hundred thousand pound making a loss, they're going to have to ask the clubs for some money back. They're going to have to, you know, it could be really problematic for the game. So I think, you know, and and I mean, mentioning Toronto as well, that is realistically why. Yeah. The Championship Grand Final isn't in a neutral venue because they're terrified that Toronto are going to get there. There'll be 50 people supporting Toronto and ultimately whoever they're playing with will make up the rest of the crowd. Uh, Zach Brown says we need to go, uh, we need to either go in all guns blazing or sack it off. I think yeah, you referring to the yeah. expansion clubs and, and the North American. That's market. dead right, that's dead right. Uh, Lewis also says, isn't this why the 1895 Cup? has been created so that a lot more fans will be going to Wembley. I would argue Toronto will take more to Wembley than Salford and some no, other Polish sports they wouldn't, teams. They wouldn't, no, I, 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 no I, don't, I don't think they would. No um, but that's with all respect to Toronto. I think if Salford got there, they'd take 10,000, wouldn't they, to yeah. Salford. Um, but yeah, that's, that is why the 1895 Cup was created to get that extra Well, I mean, I mean but, then, but then at the same time, you could get an extra if, 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 if Batley are playing Lee at, at Wembley, that's what's that going to add? Ten thousand? Well, it's still ten thousand. No, no, I, I know completely agree. But you still, if you had Catalan or Toronto, you still, or you know, you still gonna have a problem, aren't you? Even if you have Liam Batley, yeah, as well. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Damien May says, been over at the game in bits of Toronto or Catalan final, for example. Uh, Jason Pilmore with the twenty twenty one World Cup. Is there a Canadian national team? Well, there is a Canadian national team, but they've. Failed to qualify. Yeah, they got beat the by USA, didn't they? I think because obviously Jamaica's qualifiers qualified uh, instead of Jamaica competed in the Americas Championship last year in in Jacksonville. Uh, they beat Canada, um, and it's out of the USA in the Cook Islands who takes that final uh, berth, I, I believe. Yeah. For, for so the yeah, no Canada World Cup, so no Canadian team. David says, think uh, it was Eric Perez's dream. Didn't manifest at Manchester, sorry Toronto, I think he's been a little bit mischievous though, that's why he's setting up Ottawa, and we believe uh, Ottawa, James, it was... Yeah, we believe that we know Ottawa won't be there next season, it'll be the season after, um, that is our understanding at this moment. Lewis also, uh, there's, there's plenty of comments coming in today, having worked on the 2013 World Cup, you're right, there were some great people involved working behind the scenes, and I'm glad... John Dutton, we were speaking about him earlier on, Jim, yeah, he's still there as he's a good, genuine bloke and he's working it, it, for the good of the game. John Dutton is a, is a good bloke. I mean, yeah. I don't know what... I he's, don't, a, he's, a, he's a top bloke, to be fair, and I think, the, I think as the, a chief executive, he's much more involved... Ha, like, yeah, he's very hands-on. Yeah, he's very hands-on. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, 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 chief executive I, I, in sport. I don't mind Ralph Rimmer. You know, I get on well no, with Ralph Rimmer. Ralph, I think he says. Ralph I think good. he does good things. I think the thing with John Dutton is, if the Rugby League World Cup in twenty twenty one is a success, is he going to go on to somewhere else? And you know, he he presumably he's going to want to go and work in football or somewhere else. But is there an argument to say that? If the 2021 World Cup is a success, the RFL should do everything that they can to make him the CEO of the RFL. Quite possibly, yeah. Um, yeah, he's, he's very forward thinking, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I do like him. Uh, Jason says, you're dreaming that Toronto will bring more than Salford in reply to, to Lewis. <laughs> um, uh, I think. Go on then. Right, right, so we'll move on from that then. Um, so. We're halfway through the show. Twelve to one every Thursday lunchtime. Very hot today. It is hot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have the. It. <laughs> <laughs> it will be available on demand as well, so um, it'll be up on YouTube later on, and obviously you can rewatch it on the Facebook page. So please do leave your comments, and we'll try and get back to them. Um, Great Britain kit, Drew. Yeah. Your big Great Britain. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, I love Advocate. that. I love that kit. Uh, wow. Uh, when it was released, was it on Tuesday? 
Wednesday, Wednesday or Tuesday? Wednesday or Tuesday, I can't remember, but when it was released, uh, beautiful kit. I, I've always been a big fan of uh, Great Britain kits. I remember the first, I think the first Great Britain kit I had was in 2006 uh, when they toured Australia. They actually beat the Kangaroos, I believe, in, yeah, in yeah. Sydney. It, no, it was, it, was, uh, it was Tri Nations or Four Nations. Yeah. They won a Tri Nations. It, it, it was a masterclass, wasn't it, from Sean Long? Um, he absolutely ripped the Kangaroos to pieces. Um, and, and that's been my favourite ever rugby, rugby shirt I've had. Uh, it had the Gillette sponsor in it. And when we talk about big brands, they had Gillette sponsorship uh, straight across the front. Well, Gillette, I mean, the I best mean, a man can get. I mean, one of the guys behind that Gillette sponsorship, Tony Colquitt, who used to be the uh, CEO of St. Helens, I mean, he's another good example of someone who has been involved in the game but has almost been brushed aside yeah. and, and isn't as involved as he once was. And that's a guy who had, who was responsible for getting Gillette in. Um, you know, so another example there or something. I think the thing with Great Britain is you just can't believe that they ever got rid of it, can you? Mm. Do you know what I mean? You just can't believe uh, oh, it's that like, someone would like, ever get rid of it. It's like the golden wine on the, on yeah. the chest. I mean, I've, not, I've never so, made, so as, nice. as someone who grew up with Great Britain, I, I've i never really bought into England, being honest. Because to me, it was when I grew up, it was Great Britain. Mm. And England was always... You know, England was the, the the team coached by Paul Cullen of players that weren't good enough to play for Great Britain. Just and England were playing Wales and Ireland and Scotland because ultimately Great Britain just felt it was the pinnacle all the time, wasn't it? And and, and you know, with all due respect to Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, they are nowhere near the level of England because England produced more players. Wales produced their own players, which is fantastic. But Ireland and Scotland are nowhere near. I seen a tweet before saying, "Oh, well, why is it all the build up more English?" And it's like, well, because. There's no professional clubs in Ireland and Scotland. All Congratulations to Edinburgh Eagles as well, who won the Scottish yeah, Cup last week. Fantastic, but let's let's be real. No, but let's be realistic about it. Do you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I can't believe it was ever scrapped in the first place myself. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the, it's made me look uh, look forward to the the tour this autumn a little bit more. We're still looking for sponsorship here at Love Rugby League if you want to pay for <laughs> yeah. me and James to go over there. We're trying we're to get Steve from the next office, Telecom Solutions, yeah. give him a show. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. trying to get him to sponsor us and fly us over. Uh, we'll, to, we'll, uh, we'll wear your logo on our tops, you can have your logo all over the website, all over Facebook. We'll do Links Facebook to the websites. Live. We'll, we'll have we'll Facebook Lives every day, won't we? Yeah, but we can do whatever you want. Whatever you want, yeah, five Just weeks. Pay us over there. <laughs> um, <laughs> David Taylor says, where are the Cumbria World Cup, Cup games going? Newcastle would be a good call. There's, yeah, there's no games going to be in Cumbria whatsoever uh, in the 2021 World Cup. They've got to keep it north, though, haven't they? Yeah. It's got, it's after, somewhere in the north. Uh, after Workington's stadium, uh, new stadium plans got cancelled and stalled by Oladell Council, uh, did, no did, games will be going to Cumbria. Didn't Wigan get any games? Wigan didn't get any so games. Maybe it's classes Wigan, Wigan and Lee, Wigan Borough. Um, so that would make sense to uh, maybe take some to Wigan. Possibly, but would Wigan be too big for some games? It, it, it depends what games are going to be at Cumbria. Because mm. if, if, say, for example, it's Cook Islands v Samoa, mm. that, that could have fit a, a 12,000 capacity ground, but would that be too... too like, yeah, would yeah, Wigan be mean. too big for Unless the rejects would have fit... Uh, the, or uh, could, you, could, you, could you have some of them? Maybe... Was Bolton Black- announced originally? Yeah, I think it's Bolton. Was Blackpool, is Blackpool, Blackpool an option? I don't Preston, know. possibly. I think mean, you'd have to keep it north, wouldn't you? Mm. Um, but uh, David says Newcastle will be a good call. Kings- yeah. Kingston Park? Now, my issue with Newcastle is can they play an artificial? That's my. Because uh, that's why yeah. I witness, the yeah. witness have not, have not been able to go for it because of the artificial pitch. So yeah. I wonder whether that's another re- that's a reason why mm. you could. Because I don't point. think they sanction international games on. Certainly, yeah. t- first grade international games yeah. on artificial pitches. Could have it at Carlisle to keep it co- slightly Cumbria way. Is that, is that good enough there, Graham? I'm not sure. It's a bit, Who knows? bit old, isn't it? Uh, Jason Pelmore says, yeah, looks like there are loads that support their team. Look at Winners versus Toronto last Sunday. Sheffield Eagles would take more, and they don't bring many when they play Fed either. I mean, the, the other thing with, I mean, I mean, the other thing with, with Toronto and, and Catalan is they only get two or three weeks notice, don't they, to, 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 to be in the final. And it's a lot easier to drive, to arrange driving or getting the train from the north to, to London for Wembley than it is to arrange a flight from Canada or from yeah, France yeah. or whatever. Um, we'll talk about Challenge Cup semi-finals in a little bit. Um, transfers is the next talking point. So we're a bit of 
a bit of transfer talk this week. Wigan heavily linked with George Burgess, believed to have made him a, a three-year deal. Um, it would be a, it, it, it. big signing for Wigan. It would be because Wigan have been quiet, haven't they? The last few years, they've not. It, it'd, have to, teams have... it'd have to be a marquee contract, wouldn't it, for George Burgess? Um, obviously, George Williams is joining Canberra from next year, so there's a marquee uh, spot freed up. But well, his uh, Hastings Burgess. is going as marquee though, isn't it? Hastings is going as marquee, but you can have two marquees, yeah, yeah, can't yeah. you? So Burgess would be the second marquee player at Wigan for 2020. I'm not sure how I, f- how I feel. Like. Obviously, I've, I've voiced my opinions in the past about Leeds and Trent Merrin. I just don't think are marquee forwards the way to go, or should mm. you have two marquee backs when you're paying that kind of money? But. But could you make the argument that because they've got Hardacre already? True, but yeah. Uh, but but Hardacre's going to need his contracts upgraded in the near mm. future because uh, they, they might have got him slightly on the cheek because of, of his past and, and they took a chance on him. Yeah. But it's only a matter of time before clubs come sniffing around at Zach Hardacre because he's on a low contract and then they'll need it upgraded. Well, I mean, I think for me, Wigan need a hooker, don't they? I think that's a, a key. I think Wigan need yeah. to sign a hooker. So, um, but, but I think Tommy Lillewire set to stay on next year. I know, so. but I mean, at, at some point in the next 12 months, they're going to have to sign a hooker, aren't they? Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, it's looking at, well, who can they get and, and, and what whatnot. Um, but Burgess, I, I think Burgess should be, I think, I think if, if, it was, if it was Sam Burgess, I think your opinion would be different. So because he's a very because Sam Burgess is more of a marquee player really yeah. than George Burgess. Yeah. I mean, as much as they've done well in the NRL, he's not at the profile of Sam Burgess. Yeah. Um, you know, he's not at that sort of profile. I think any of the Burgess boys, though, because because of the profile, I think they'd be automatic fan favourites at the club, mm. whichever club they do go to, uh, just because of what they have achieved in the NRL. Uh, George, there's no doubt he's a, he's a world-class player, he's a world-class prop forward. Um, and he'll certainly have plenty of grunts to Wigan's part because that's where I think Wigan have struggled in recent years, especially when you compare the uh, Wigan's pack to the likes of St. Helens, Warrington, uh, the top two clubs, even Hull from next year when they signed the Tonga and Terminator, Manu <laughs> Mao. Um, yeah, Wigan definitely needs to strengthen the pack. Uh, I think George Burgess will be a good signing. I do. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, he's, 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 of course he is. He's, he's, of course he's a good signing. Just signing is a good signing. Good yeah. signing. Oh, of course. But, but it's just it's how just, it fits into the bigger picture. Yeah. It's, it's, it's whether it's what piece of the jigsaw he is. Because ultimately, if he's a, a big piece of the jigsaw, but then you're missing pieces, then it's not going to work. Yeah. Um. I th- yeah. I think he'll be. I think he will be a good fit for for Wigan. Uh, it'll go well because obviously. The, some of the, the players in the Wigan pack now are, are starting to age as well. Tony yeah. Club and Ben Your Flower. Mate, Lockers. Uh, Captain Fantastic, Sean O'Loughlin. Um, uh, he'll probably Captain uh, Great Britain. You reckon? Uh, is that also. what you're going for? Is that what well, you're going well, for? Of course you If he's fit, you have him in your team. If he's um, fit, you have him in your well, team. Some other transfers, then we'll move from Wigan. Uh, um, David Taylor Ola. says, this, uh, I think you've got to come on to this, James Maloney. Uh, in yeah. Catalan, he, he says that he's there for the the Catalan Dragons. The club say uh, James Maloney is the first ever marquee player, but uh, David seems to think Sam Tompkins is on a marquee deal. Well, it, it, it depends, doesn't it? Because um, it's up to the club. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't matter, does it? Does it, it, makes, does it make a matter? Does it make a massive difference? No, Maloney's arrival at, at the Dragons, obviously, need kind of forces someone out of the club, doesn't it? Because Matty got, Smith's, Matty Smith's go, got to yeah. be going, hasn't he? He's, got, he's, not even, he's not really no. done much here, has it, he? You've, because you've got Sam Tompkins, you've got Tony Gijo, you've got Matty Smith, you've got Sammy Sony Lange, he's just signed an extended deal. So you've, you've got them four players there now, and then Ad Maloney, that's a fifth player. Do you think Gijo will go? Uh, well, that's it. His, his contract's open, isn't, yeah, it, isn't yeah, it, at yeah. the end of the year? So could... Could Giro go, but then is that not counterproductive? Yeah, I mean, like when it's like you know, Fre- France's gone. best player, yeah, yeah. France's best player in in Tony Giro not playing for the only well, the only. Well, maybe maybe maybe, maybe 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 get promoted and Giro can go and play for them. There you go. But what about Mark Crowe? Well, he can play centre, can he? Or, oh. or stand off? What about Mo? Because I I thought Morgan Escre was going back to Catalan as well. Or is he going to go to Toulouse? Well. <laughs> 
<laughs> no. I mean, well, I mean, I think Esker is a bit lightweight, isn't it? I mean, you could play him on the wing, but... Well, keep, keep your eye out for our French roundup, you might. Yeah, French roundup up every Monday. We, uh, we have a bit of... We have all the news from the French domestic game from the Elite 1, Elite 2 competitions uh, down in France. Their season runs November through to June. Um, the Magic Weekend kicks off the French season. Me and Drew, we're looking for sponsorship for that as well, actually. We should, we should just chuck that out. If we don't make it to the Great Britain tour... We're gonna to go to Carcass on for the French Magic Weekend. Yeah, but we want we yeah. want to go to Great Britain. You so. want to go Great Britain? Um, just ch- throw us five grand over. It's about ten grand. <laughs> well, yeah, Ryan Atkins. Uh, Ryan Atkins is apparently off to Wakefield at the end of the season. He's had wrist surgery, which has ruled him out for the rest of the season um, to get him in shape to go to Wakefield at the end of the year. Um, Wakefield, interesting time there because they've started. They, they've. they've Slip down the table a little bit. They're getting a bit of grief off the fans. They've got a tough run in. Um, they've got injuries. Mm. They've got players coming out of contract. You know, they, they, they're facing a bit of adversity, Wakefield, for the first time in a couple of years, aren't they? Yeah, they are, and I, I worry about them uh, in this last six weeks of the season because they've got the toughest run in out of all clubs. They're not getting any players back anytime soon, I don't think. Um, so the problems aren't easy. Uh, Chris Chester said after the defeat to Wakefield, uh, the defeat to Wigan last Thursday that he's going to give his players five days off mm. because obviously they've, they've the week off probably weekend. come at a good time for them. It's, yeah, it's certainly come at a good time for them, but it's how they bounce back and how they return to training. There doesn't seem anything wrong with the attitude of the players, but when I watched them against Wigan. The defence were absolutely dreadful, like really woeful defending, uh, appalling defending. That, uh, um, we, 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 we were commenting on it in the office, the Gildarts one where Jowett. Yeah, G- Gildarts so. one uh, for both of Liam Farrell's tries, I think it was Jake and Miller who brought out the old turnstile defending technique, um, just let Farrell waltz through um, and well, like as good as it was from George Williams when he scampered across the line. He literally ran from one end of the field, one side yeah, of the field, yeah. to the other. Yeah. And Wakefield didn't even put an arm on him. Mm. Um, so it was shocking defending. Um, it would be interesting to see how they bounce back because haven't they got to play Wigan again? They've got to play Warrington. The last have game. They got to play St. Helens? I'm not sure, but their last game is London at home. Wow. So, London, wow. I mean, London have, London have got all the cards, haven't they? Because London's last three games are Leeds, Ulk, and Wakefield. So, um, it's all down. It's all in London's hands. Yeah, I, 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 honestly, I, probably two months ago, I, when, when Chris Chester actually first said Wakefield re- relegation battle, I thought, nah, he's just saying, he's just saying that to... to but has, it, has he created no this way. pressure then by saying that? Has he created that pressure by chucking them into the relegation battle no, weeks and weeks ago? Has he, has, he, has he added that no, pressure? No, he's not. He, he do not have anything to do with that. It's just that the players aren't performing. Uh, the, the, I could probably count on one hand the amount of players that are, are playing relatively well at the moment. I, I don't, I don't even think I can count five players. Um, Bill Tupu is only just returning from injury, so he's still a bit rusty. Obviously, Tom Johnson has been a big miss for Wakefield on the wing because mm. he's, he's a 20 try winger mm. per season. It's interesting to see what happens with Ryan Hampshire as well. Obviously, he's out of contracts at the end of the season. Wakefield have tabled him a deal, he's stalled the deal. Uh, another club's come in with a lower offer than what Wakefield uh, had tabled to Ryan Hampshire. I, I, I really worry for Wakefield, you know. Real, I really think they are in. Deep, deep trouble, and I think if London don't get relegated, I think it might be Wakefield because just just because of the running, it's it's. We'll have a piece on the runnings, so, so the runnings on Super League, in Super League relegation, uh, Super League playoff race, and of course the Championship playoff G- and relegation races. They'll go on site early next week. Uh, Jason also asked, can I ask why the Championship grand final is going to be held in Toronto and not a neutral ground <laughs> like Super League uh, in brackets? Old traffic. Let's go through uh, what we were talking about on Monday, right? So, the championship playoffs is a complete farce, in my opinion. So, we're still trying to get this confirmed because no one appears to know how it's going to work. So, yeah, it is going to pr- probably end up in Toronto unless someone beats Toronto, which looks unlikely. But we think that this is how terrible it is. So, let's say second place, third in that first round. Let's just say it's York versus Lee. 
just because, just to say names because it's easier. Lee could go to York and beat York, then Lee go to Toronto, lose to Toronto, which means Lee get another chance. Meanwhile, York have beaten, say, Featherston, and then it's Lee v York again. But even though Lee beat York in the first game, it's still going to be at York. <laughs> oh, honest to God. It's how on it, how why, on why, it, why does it have to be complicated? Why, it's just, the thing is, is the cop criticism for... They cop criticism for a reason, and this, this, I understand that obviously the, the logistics of Toronto is fine, but no, integrity of the competition, the championship has always been a neutral venue, the playoff format, you should always take the seed, the seed, if you beat a higher seed, you should take their seed in, because that's how it's always worked, that's how it should always work, they, they don't help themselves, people get critical about Toronto and things like that, and you know, in the past, Celtic Crusade and stuff, and they don't help themselves, because they do move the goalposts to suit these teams. And, and this is a, a good example it's, of that. I, I jo- this is working out the playoff fixtures is harder than solving a blue and, Rubik's cube. And so it's like stupid. That. It's it's completely stupid. The grand final should be somewhere neutral, headingly, whatever. And, and it's not even kicked off yet between the fans because when when it actually comes to the point where yeah, they've, got to, it they've got to do all this travelling, there's going to be so much uproar. Well, we are looking at Lee. From the Lee, championship fans. Lee could end up playing Toronto away. To lose away, Toronto away, to lose away, Toronto away in five weeks running. I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of, you know, it's unlikely that that's going to happen. But they could have to play Toronto away three times in five weeks, and in the two in the weeks in between, play to lose away twice. And these are part-time rugby league players, and that it comes back to what we were saying before. It's if you're going to do this franchise and overseas clubs. They need to be a top. They need to be in the top league. They shouldn't be playing with parts. They shouldn't be playing with with bloody teachers and, and builders and stuff like that, should they? That brings us to prompt uh, a licensing feature that we've got on LoveRugbyLeague.com today. A throwback Thursday feature, which is eleven years ago to the day. I'll let it. It's your feature. Eleven name, years since the first Super League license announcement. Um, the doomed licensing concept, I suppose. Um, Lee were very outspoken about not getting in some uh, interesting words <laughs> from Alan Rowley. I think you're, yeah. In fact, Alan Rowley's... Uh, <laughs> we won't mention that, this, we won't talk about that. Drew's had a quote of the week this week. We're not going to... I can't say it on air. Um, <laughs> but if Paul Rowley's watching, Drew hasn't stopped banging on about a comment that was made to him. At the, what game were you at? At Wigan? At Sol- uh, uh, Salford, Salford, Cat- Salford Catalan on Sunday. I was made anyway. up. It made, um, me, made me 2019 so far. Right, well, we'll move on from that anyway. So 15 minutes left. We'll talk about this weekend's game. We'll focus on the Cup semi-finals, the Challenge Cup semi-finals. Um, Warrington Hull is the first game, 2 o'clock on I'm Saturday. Sweaty. It I'm is off. We'll, we'll get through this uh, quickly. To, to, uh, it's, no, it's the Women's Challenge Cup final first, but uh, it, between Castleford and Leeds, but uh, it's going to be Castleford. Castleford, uh, they absolutely pumped um, Wakefield, Wakefield and and even Mill. with an ineligible player though. It, it could have it could have gone the other way if, <laughs> if that player hadn't played. Yeah, uh, maybe. It might have been hundred um, nil on the other four. Yeah, I'm gonna try and get there and, and see that that game. Um, but but Warrington Hull two o'clock. Um, Warrington on a bit of a bit of a ropey run. This Hull. is this is interesting. This game. This this is so this you cannot call this because I keep thinking. Uh, should should I put it Warrington out? Because I do. I think Warrington have got a better team, but then I think no Hull Hull are, are experienced in the cup. There. Well, that's the thing. I think the thing that games. gets me is Hull in tw- won it in twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen. And while Warrington have been to the finals in, in yeah. a few recent years, I just think Hull have got something about them, and I think they could really stick one up their critics Hull if they get to the final and win it again. Um, a bit more pressure on Warrington. It'd be interesting how Blake, Austin. More, more interesting Austin. How Blake Austin does because obviously it's a, a big occasion. Yeah. Um, you know, oh. my man for the All right, occasion. All right, I'm going to go with it now. I'll, I'll put Warrington. I'll right, put, well, I'll, I'll, go, I'll Warrington go Hull then. Um, St. Helens playing Halifax at four o'clock. Um, it'd be interesting to see how many people are still left in the ground at five o'clock. <laughs> um, Halifax, great little story, great little day out for them. Um, it's... They can't, they can't do it. It would, it would be the greatest shock of all time, wouldn't it? We, we, we were checking um, the odds the other day in the office uh, for the St. Helens Halifax game uh, with the competition partners, Coral, and I think it was it one to 200 St. Helens were priced at. So yeah. if, you, 
If you put a tenner on Saints, you get ten point five P back. Which is uh Well we, <laughs> the, we, we, we started getting yeah, a bit silly, didn't we? we, 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 we if, you, if you put if you put nine million on, you're only getting <laughs> Just under ten, a penny, a penny short of ten million would win you about forty grand, fifty grand. It, for a semi-final, these are, must be the big, the, the shortest of the I mean, money stocks. I mean, I, I mean, I spoke I've to I spoke to Simon Gricks on Monday. Um, it's hard to know because, like, do they dig in? You know, do you just dig in and try and keep them down? But ultimately, once they've broken you, I mean, I think Simon Gricks seemed to suggest that they were going to have a go and, and and try and play a bit and. Um, you just hope that it's not a... I think St. Helens will respect the occasion enough that they'll keep it to maybe 50. I don't I, I don't foresee a situation where St. Helens do 80 or 90. No, no, no. I can't, I can't see them getting to 80. Just, just for the fact, I think Halifax are better than conceding 90 points. Yeah. Um, I th- yeah, I think it would be around the, the 50 points to maybe 6 score line, something like that. Um, I just say it's a too powerful... They rested a lot of players at London last week it, with respect to, to Halifax according to Justin Albrook so them players are fresh coming into this game against Fax the part time players Fax it, uh, it, I mean it, it'd be, it would be, uh, wouldn't it be great to see Halifax proper give it a go and make a game of it for, for 40 50 minutes I think that's what I, yeah, that's what uh, I, I, th- I think it's only a matter of time though in, in that yeah. second half before the fitness pairs but you know, you know, I remember the the million pound game last year. So true, London, true. Don't give London a chance. And I mean, I know it's you know a very different. There's a, a, a much bigger gap between these two teams. But um, yeah, interesting one there. So we got the so we're going to stay in town with them for uh, for that second one. Go University of Bolton Stadium on is it the University of Bolton Stadium? Yeah, what do they call yeah. it? The Arena. University of Bolton Arena. Not no, stadium. University of Bolton Stadium. Saturday we'll be there. Full of rugby league. Follow it all. On the website, Facebook, Twitter, whatnot. Um, there's some more semi finals this week. It's the 1895 Cup semi finals. Both of these are going to be broadcast on the Our League app on Sunday. And Switch. And Switch. And Switch. Did you say Switch? Switch. 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 Dave Parkinson's Switch. on commentary at Batley versus Sheffield. Someone's definitely mugging Dave off at the RFL because <laughs> they sent him to Batley and Sheffield instead of watching League against <laughs> Winners. Um, Batley Sheffield, Batley have never played at Wembley, um, even though they were the first Challenge Cup winners, yep. I think. Um, never played at Wembley, so a massive, massive uh, opportunity for Matt Diskin's men there against Sheffield. The winnable game against Sheffield, it has to be said. Of course, Sheffield have got probably the most iconic rugby league Wembley story of all time when they beat Wigan in 1998. And of course, Mark Aston, who was the Lance Todd Trophy winner in that match, is the coach. I mean, what an, a fairy tale that would be for him as well yeah. to, to go back to of, Wembley. Of course, and I'm, I'm backing him to, to achieve that feat as well, James. I think Sheffield will have too much for Batley. Sheffield have surprised me this season mm. completely. Mm. Didn't expect them to be half as good could as be a massive, they have been. Could be a massive boost for Sheffield. They could it? even make the top five in the Championship yeah. come the end of the yeah. season. Could well make that top five. Um, and it'd be, how good would it be? It'd just be a... It, it's, Sometimes scripts are written for, for journals like us, James, to, it, to, to write this fairy tale. And be. I think Mark Aston to reach Wembley as a coach mm. be after, a great after, after, story. after he achieved the feat with, with the Eagles against Wigan, being such big underdogs, mm. um, and to do it again and to reach Wembley, the promised land once again, it would be an unbelievable story. I mean, I mean, obviously, there's been a little bit of controversy, or well, not controversy, but a little bit of talk about. Um, the financial rewards of this match it will be really interesting to see whether Sheffield if they do make it whether they can make something out of it make a bit of money help them develop the ground a bit more and um, and use it as a stepping stone to build up hopefully so when it's come out in recent months that there will be prize money for the 1895 mm. Cup after it originally it wasn't going to offer anything to the clubs just a day to Wembley mm. uh, but there will be a, a prize fund for the winner well for the competing teams at Wembley at the final which is great news because hopefully it'll give the the, the lower league clubs a little pot to to play with and, and obviously re. Well, a team that uh, needs spend the money on the grounds and a club, facilities. A club that needs some money. Witness are playing Lee away on on Sunday. Um, they both they played each other once or uh, twice already this season. Witness won at Witness Lee won yeah. at Summerbash in Blackpool. Um, 
lots of little stories off the back of Lee Witness Witness have given a, a new deal to Kevin Pirtle for next season, who of course is a Lee lad and was Lee coach last mm -hmm. season. Um, Witness's last cup semi final ended in disgrace when they played at Lee in, in twenty fourteen against Castleford and we had all them pitch invasions at the end. Um it's been a while since we, I think Witness last played at Wembley in ninety three. Um but Lee huge favourites for this game you'd say. Yeah, they've made a couple of good signings as well, haven't they, recently? In uh, Junior So, Mitch Clark and Anna Mixon from yeah. Toronto. Uh they've got a strong team, Lee. We've said plenty of times on the show in recent weeks that we're tipping them to maybe <laughs> yeah, upset yeah. Toronto yeah. in their uh, race for promotion to, to Super League. And of I course, Derek Bournemouth's name is already on the trophy. And it is. And he's got a, a little F1 simulation car uh, <laughs> that's going to be at Batley Sheffield, I think. Is uh, it? Yeah. Is that what Dave's driving there? Yeah. Might be. Yeah. Um, we, we've not seen Dave in recent weeks, so we might become. Maybe he's been on Silverstone. He's been well, on Silverstone. He, he might become Rugby League Stig. Uh, yeah, yeah. and driving it all the way around to battle in Sheffield but uh, I think yeah, Lille will be too strong for, for winners with many respects to winners they've got a very young team yeah, I mean, it's, it's very in inexperienced it's good for the, the young kids as well to, to play in the semi-finals and to, to be playing in, against men in effect in, in the championship but I just think Lille will be Witness have powerful. been um, Witness have been pretty poor away from home um, you know, they did alright against Toronto at home last week mm. Um, you know, it was a good. Game. It was a decent game actually. That's one of the winners game last week. Um, but yeah, you, you fancy in Lee? Are you going Lee Sheffield for a final then? Yeah. So Lee. what are you going? We're going. What are you going? Warrington Saints. Warrington Saints. I'm going Hull Halifax. No, I'm going Hull. This Hull side Saints. of the Pennines. Warrington Saints. Right, okay. The cup's going back to this I side go, of the Pennines. I go Hull Halifax and then at Hull Saints, and then in the eighty ninety five cup, you're going Lee Sheffield. Yeah. I go Lee Batley. You're just doing this to go against me, are you? No, I, 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 I just think, no. I think, I, I think Batley, Batley will give it a, a, a good dig. Um, I think it would be good. I mean, it's, a good, it's going to be a good story, whoever gets there, isn't it? Uh, I, I, think, I think whoever gets there, I think, I think if Lee get to, well, if Lee or Witness get to the, the final, I think they could both take up to maybe seven or 8,000 fans. Mm -hmm. Do you reckon mm -hmm. for the trip to Wembley? And well, then Sheffield I mean, Sheff and back with two thousand fans. I, I think I've been a bit I've been a bit disappointed by some people's attitude to the eight nine five cup because some people have, have you know have, have, have called the competition. It's like ultimately it's a it's another competition, it's silverware. The finals at Wembley, these teams have no should be nowhere near at Wembley. With all due respect, the the chance to play at Wembley is fantastic for someone oh. like someone like Batley or, or even for Lee or for it's, it's madness, isn't it, to think that some of these players in the 1895 Cup final will, on the Saturday, be playing on the Wembley pitch and then on the Monday be on the building site yeah, at 8, it's 8, 8 o'clock like, in the morning. It's a huge opportunity for players of these clubs, for supporters of these clubs, to see their team at Wembley, which realistically, sh it's a hu it should be talked up to the hilt, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Jason says uh, Sheffield will not get in the top five. It's going to be Toronto... Uh, Fev, Toulouse, York and Lee. Probably agree though, but I think Sheffield are not, not out to um, and out just well. yet. Um, and I th I'm tipping Lee for promotion. Um, Jason says Lee will win the 1895 Cup and Derek Beaumont will win his money back that he pumped into the competition <laughs> by sponsoring it with his company AB Sunday. Jason thinks Wire v Saints final and Lee versus Batley. See, there you go. So he, I think he's got in between me and you though. Yeah, yes. Right, well, um, thanks everyone for, for watching this week. Uh, I think it's time for an ice cream. Yeah, rugby league lunch hour. We're going to see Mr. Whippy now. Um, please do leave your comments, uh, like and share. Obviously, it's available on demand as well on our YouTube channel and via the website. Uh, please do make it loverugbyleague.com for the latest news, views, features, and everything else from the world of rugby league. And that's all from us for today. See you next week.